Moving on, our next speaker of the, of the morning gave uh, two wonderful talks yesterday and uh, be giving another one today, Dr. Sierra uh, Unzueta, for, uh, an oxygen metabolism in trauma. Good morning, thank you very much. I'm going to try to summarize the aspects that I believe are more significant so that you can take back the messages as to the key points because oxygen metabolism is something that's quite extense. It's not a very easy topic, but we're going to try to offer uh, a summary on what is most important. I have put on this overhead in the central part of the slide uh, the responsible parties for taking oxygen to the cells. And as we saw yesterday, basically it would be the heart as the pump, hemoglobin as the extraordinary molecule that it is that is capable of, capable of taking in its four uh, sites of union oxygen and um, provide it to the tissues. And of course, some of the changes that take place in the dissociation, hemoglobin dissociation curve that have a dynamic character and that are adjustments that are made by a, a human being's physiology to defend us from injury. And I'm going to try to give an overview of all of this. I'm sure that you are very familiar that you know that the oxygen that is in the air at sea, sea level exerts a pressure of 259 uh, milli millimeters of mercury, and that this cascade uh, causes for the oxygen to go down depending on the place where we measure it. But what's important is for us to see that when it enters with a pressure of 159 in the air and it's mixed with air vapor. It goes down until in the myoglobin, uh, the values that we can measure are six and in the uh, cell mitochondria, it's at five. The message here is that we should always make the necessary adjustments based on the place where we live because altitude influences this quite a bit. For example, we at the Angeles Hospital in Las Lomas, it's, it has a, we live in a place of a, quite a bit of altitude. In, instead of having 160 millimeters of mercury of barometric pressure, we are operating at 572. So, uh, our values as to gases in the blood uh, undergo quite a modification. And if you have a 20-year-old year adult that has uh, 55 uh, pressure or 57, that's considered normal. And this also influences, also, what also influences this is that a human being tries to adapt to altitude, but there is more uh, ventilation per minute and also washing the carbon the carbon dioxide uh, molecule. So we also have to take the values for carbon dioxide from where you live as references so that you can correctly interpret what's going on. Yesterday we already saw that the oxygen that is provided to the tissues uh, go back to the right blood and that the difference in the arteriovenous oxygen measured in arterial blood and central venous is five. And that what is important is for us to remember that this protein 
that weighs less than one kilo, which is one kilogram and which is hemoglobin is something so fantastic that in spite of all of the attempts that have been done in research, uh, it cannot be substituted with any kind of uh, synthesized preparations. Uh, Nothing is similar to hemoglobin. It would be great if we could uh, create something like this, but basically the blood volume, the hematocrit, and the hemoglobin values together with the heart's pumping, this is what determines the availability of oxygen. The other key point is that we have to learn how to interpret the normal dissociation curve, the hemoglobin curve. This value of 66, uh, which is for Mexico City and uh, In Mexico City, it's 585 millimeters of mercury and barometric pressure determines a saturation of 94% if we have a curve located at the perfect spot. And the pressure values for saturation are for 50% of hemoglobin. This is P50 in Mexico City, are 27 And uh, I repeat, uh, this is a curve, uh, this is for a, here, for a curve that is located at a normal place. So 27 is what would achieve 50% saturation of the hemoglobin, but it turns out that the curve can also go more towards the right or more towards the left, depending on whether we are viewing uh, adaptation mechanisms that are taking place as part of uh, the response to normal physiology or whether it's due to pathological phenomena due to alterations. This is very dynamic. It can go from one side to the other. And for example, what happens when we have acidosis because of hypoperfusion, immediately the curve goes towards the right. And this allows us to be able to provide oxygen better to the cells. And when the curve goes towards the left because of uh, hypocapnia or metabolic alkalosis, uh, blood is saturated better, but less is received by the tissues. So this is a dynamic phenomenon. And Uh, There is no doubt that hemoglobin, when it drops, uh, causes, if you measure its transportation through the oxygen content, and when you have half the amount of hemoglobin, of course, the content will also drop to half, and the uh, cardiac blood flow will have to increase its expulsion volume every minute in order to compensate for this phenomenon. But you can see that when there is no hemoglobin, uh, at zero hemoglobin, the only thing that we would be transporting is the dissolved oxygen, oxygen dissolved in the plasma. This is nothing. It It doesn't help us in any way. The curve shows very important sites. Uh, part that we have indicated at number one. All of the pressure changes are reflected in a very important manner in saturation. A second part, which you can see here at number three, where we don't see such a pronounced drop. It kind of like starts to flatten. And there, uh, changes in pressure still bring about reasonable changes in saturation. But at four, the pressure can rise quite a bit, and it won't influence uh, hemoglobin saturation much. So you have to know how to interpret, based on pressure, the location on the curve of the uh, sites where there would be an important risk to life. And this is something that we will try to look at right now. Here we again have P50, and it's located at that site. And 
in the places where I've drawn arrows, it's to indicate critical or key points in this very important and interesting uh, hemoglobin dissociation curve. What is quite certain is that if you measure central venous blood and you measure oxygen pressure there in the right auricle or in the pulmonary artery, what is certain is that if we see a value of 27 and a saturation of 50%, that is half, it's certain that we have tissue hypoxia taking place. There are many markers that medicine has presently, uh, lactate uh, measurements, uh, taking into consideration that lactate sometimes needs to be washed in uh, perfusion territories in or vital organs, saturation in the superior vena cava, the right oracle, the gastric tonometry, the measuring uh, sublingual PCO2, et cetera, et cetera. There are many ways in which we have tried to investigate to see which of these can be of greater help in interpreting these uh, very important m markers. For example, insofar as PVO2 mix, which is the pulmonary artery, we can see that there are conditions where uh, this is affected, the pressure is affected, and the saturation is affected. For example, at a level of 42, we might see this in septic shock or in a, a short circuit from left to right or because of the use of inotropics or because of the use of hyperbaric oxygen. And when we see normal values from 36 to 42, this would be uh, at sea level. And with lactic acidosis, as was said before, you can see that there is a tissue hypoxia, a hypoxia which causes the lactic acid, and we find this at a value of 27. At lower values... Um, they are very serious, obviously. And we can see, therefore, that the uh, hemoglobin dissociation curve uh, uh, causes that when oxygen is delivered, the venous oxygen comes back in one of the areas where the slope is quite pronounced and where there are small changes in pressure. Uh, we observe important changes in saturation. And if the central venous saturation drops to values such as are shown here at 60, most likely it's because the cardiac flow uh, decreased 25% of oxygen or because there's an increase in blood consumption because of a given factor that causes this increased consumption of oxygen. If it goes down to values of 27, the PVO2 with a saturation of 50, which is P50, then we are quite sure that uh, cardiac flow dropped 50% or there was an increase in oxygen consumption so noticeable as when we have a maximum exertion. So when we measure venous, central venous blood, this can help us to be able to infer certain changes in circulation and even ask ourselves whether this patient is undergoing uh, tissue hypoxia or not. Hypoxemia and anemia have to be interpreted in a different way because here you can see the normal uh, values of saturation of hemoglobin and content and also what happens when we have hypoxia and what happens when there's anemia. So you can see that in anemia, the pressures don't change. In hypoxemia, yes, obviously, uh, oxygen pressure and saturation drops, the content drops, and also the amount of tish, uh, tissue oxygen drops. Yesterday, 
we said that the brain together with the heart are champions at taking oxygen from the blood that is perfusing it and the arterial venous difference is seven and the value of PVO2 in venous, jugular venous blood that is coming back from the brain is lower than what we find in the right oracle because of the extraordinary metabolism that the brain and the heart have. We mentioned yesterday that there's a difference there of 10. The affinity of hemoglobin and oxygen can increase in all of the conditions that you see on the screen. There are many increased temperature, hemoglobin anormalities, uh, decrease in PCO2, uh, etc., etc. All of this uh, causes hemoglobin to bind more, to be closer to oxygen, and for it to release it more easily. Harder. And on the other hand, if we think that there may be a decrease in uh, affinity, such as in the acidosis, then there are also many causes that make the curve uh, go more towards the right. Here we can see a curve on the left hand side, alkalosis, P50 of 22, not 27. And here we have a curve that is more towards the right because of acidosis. But what's important is for us to see that when we have acidosis and acidosis because of hypoperfusion or whatever cause you could think of, when it's prolonged over time, what happens is that uh, because of the effects of the acidosis, the metabolism uh, is uh, depressed and prolonged persistent acidosis makes the curve go up towards the levels of a normal curve. But this means that it's worse for uh, the body. So persistent acidosis that is not resolved makes the curve go towards uh, the normal side because of uh, depression in the synthesis of two, three visceral biphosphate. So there are four variables that are key to the transportation of oxygen. We've talked about them quite a bit now, and there are conditions where the saturation of uh, venous uh, central oxygen can help us uh, figure out what's happening on, but there's no doubt that our body is so extraordinary that, for example, in Mexico, in the uh, mountainside in Puebla, there are people that live with 1.8 grams of hemoglobin, and they climb up the mountain. They do exercise, but they're used to this process uh, taking place. It's something that has taken place over a, a long time and the body has to do a series of adaptations to be able to achieve this. There are situations in which we also measure the availability of oxygen. We are able to define certain sites where consumption is very dependent on the site and there are other areas where it is independent of the site and we can see this in normal conditions. And when we look at the saturation of venous oxygen recently, we were trying to work on uh, guidelines uh, for uh, cardiac surgery, and we did a systematic review uh, because we wanted to answer this uh, question as to whether you can substitute the values of venous blood from the pulmonary artery or mixed by measuring the oxygen pressure in the superior vena cava. And all of the articles that uh, we reviewed uh, did not answer the question fully because the values in comparisons, and you can see here this representation uh, 
by Bland and Altman indicate that they vary quite a bit and that they can be very different. So different as you can see here uh, in this chart that represents all of these values. And we reviewed all of the articles that had been published to date in this regard. And we continue to investigate and we have realized that in the patient, uh, an open heart surgery patient, we can't say that what you measure in the right oracle or in the uh, superior cava is the same as what you measure in the pulmonary artery in totally mixed venous blood. So the conclusion of these studies is that there are tendencies for them both to be similar, uh, but they are not the same. So everything that we have said indicates that availability depends on the amount used of the hemoglobin and oxygen saturation. And we always carry it to indexed values, that is, to values uh, taken to a method of uh, body surface. We found critical values as to consumption and availability in a seriously ill patient. But when we don't have a reduction in tissue metabolism, it means that we have good oxygen transportation. And how can we explain also that our body is can adopt so well to hypoxia that a mountain climber at the top of uh, Everest has these values in his arterial blood and venous pressure of 21? But a patient that has um, acute respiratory distress in intensive therapy has values of 52 and 29 in venous bloods. How can the body of these people that know how to gradually adapt to progressive hypoxia, that the body can develop these adaptation mechanisms that are extraordinary? So the critical values for availability are 700 milliliters uh, per minute of PO2 arterial at 25, because we've seen that at Everest you can be at 28, and venous pressure of oxygen in the cava or in the pulmonary artery of 17 other factor that we have to take into consideration is that age changes oxygen consumption. The older you are, the less, the less oxygen you consume. You are also supposed to eat less, work less as you age, but that's exactly why, because you don't need to eat as much and you don't consume as much oxygen. Uh, we must always have these values uh, in mind, look at these uh, situations of chronic anemia. And this is something that was published in 62 by Roy et al., how it's possible to keep a person alive when the person develops adaptation to chronic anemia, and how each one of the different organs has availability, uh, consumption, and extraction that are different. And as we already said, uh, the organ that consumes the most proportionately is the brain and then the heart and a little bit the liver, but I'm sorry, the heart, the brain, and the, and the kidney. Hyperthermia also increases oxygen consumption, and we know how much it increases per uh, degree of temperature. And when we explore the patient, when we see him, when we touch him, just that makes oxygen consumption change. And if a nurse comes into the intensive care unit with a syringe and the patient sees the syringe, oxygen consumption is modified. We have adaptation mechanisms that are absolutely sensational. The indexed availability uh, per square meter considered as critical is in the range of 300 milliliters per minute per square meter. 
So we also have ways in which we can measure all of this in intensive therapy, measuring the supply and um, the content, the use. We can see how we utilize oxygen, measuring consumption and extraction, and at the exit point, uh, venous blood, the lactate, etc. And we know that there are illnesses that are capable of modifying uh, the flow dependence as to the availability of oxygen. We know that what you see in red in normal conditions, uh, the, the uh, amount of independence is very long that we have in these uh, physiological conditions that are ideal, but in sepsis and ARDS and other conditions, the slope becomes longer and oxygen consumption depends then very much on the flow. This is another very interesting phenomenon. Uh, um, a few comments as to oxygen extraction. Tissue metabolism determine extraction depending on the job that each organ has to carry out will be the extraction, the amount that it demands and it tries to extract or bring, take out the oxygen that it needs to carry out its metabolic activities. So it's very important for us to be totally familiar with all of this extraction that has been measured during maximum exertion goes up to values of 60 and even 80 percent when you have normal basal conditions, 0.25 on a systemic level. So exercise, having the muscles work, uh, peripheral muscles, uh, makes it capable of extracting as much oxygen as the heart, except that the heart is constantly uh, doing so. And in hemorrhagic shock, the decrease in flow when the blood is perfusing tissues very slowly, it also makes the extraction go up in an extraordinary manner. So our body and each organ has uh, extraction constants that are different. For example, the skin, almost nothing. Uh, kidneys, a little more. But the heart yes, definitely extracts a lot, has a very high slope of extraction, as does the brain. There are organs that are very dependent on flow. Others are more dependent on pressure, more so than flow. But all of this influences consumption and oxygen extraction. Many things are capable of altering the need to change the oxygen to consume more oxygen, such as mobility, fever, artificial ventilation, sedation, etc. There are so many things that can influence uh, a patient. So in summary, my uh, presentation, well, what I tried to do was to offer you some of the characteristics of what happens to oxygen metabolism in a human being, that you always have to bear in mind there are critical values that you have to be very careful with because the patient in these critical values will not tolerate um, hypoxia, definitely. And if there's something that can create tissue damage that can perhaps be non-reversible would be prolonged, would be brought about by prolonged hypoxia. Thank you very much, hypoxia. Thank you very much. Muchisimas. Are there uh, any questions from the floor? We have time for maybe one quick question. And I don't see any online, so thank you very much, Dr. Sierra. Thank you.